Welcome. My name is Dion Filmer. I'm the director of the World Bank's Development Research Group. Um, and welcome to this November edition of our policy research talk series. As some of you know, these talks uh, give us an opportunity to present our work coming from the research department uh, with the goal of sharing the findings with colleagues inside and outside the department, as well as others outside the World Bank. Um, I'd like to welcome our online audience today, both on WebEx and on YouTube. Uh, today, my colleague, Leora Clapper, who is a lead economist in the finance and private sector development team uh, within the research department, will discuss findings from the latest round of the Global Findex project. Uh, Leora is one of the founders of the Global Findex database, co-editor of the World Bank Economic Review, and she was the director of the 2022 World Development Report Finance for an Equitable Recovery. She's published widely in referee journals on corporate and household finance, fintech, banking, and entrepreneurship. Uh, her current research studies the impact of digital financial services, especially for women. Uh, today, we are really grateful to have Andrew Dublin as our discussant. Andrew is the World Bank's uh, Africa Regional Chief Economist. He's held various positions in the World Bank, including senior economist in the World Bank's Europe and Central Asia region, lead economist and practice manager for poverty and equity in Africa, and most recently, practice manager for poverty and equity in the South Asia, uh, South Asia region. His research and scholarly publications focus on poverty and social impact analysis, inequality of opportunity, program evaluation, risk and vulnerability, labor markets, and conflict and welfare outcomes. Uh, a Kenyan national, uh, Andrew holds a master's degree in international development from UC Davis and a PhD from uh, University of California, Berkeley. Usually they just say Cal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll ask Leora to talk for approximately, that's what threw me when my notes, yeah. You, uh, uh, I'll ask Leora to talk for approximately 40 minutes, after which we'll hear from Andrew for about 10 to 15 minutes. We'll conclude the session with Q&A from the audience. If you have a question, please use the raised hand option in WebEx uh, or signal to me in the chat that you'd like to um, pose a question and I'll call on you. Uh, I think it's nice if you can actually articulate the question yourself rather than having me read it out. Uh, if you're following YouTube, please submit your question in the chat and that'll get relayed to me and then I'll pose that to the panel. Uh, just a reminder, we are recording today. Uh, and please mute if you're not speaking and you're following online. So with that, over to you, Leora. Thank you. So for over the past decade, uh, we've listened to over half a million adults around the world talk about their financial lives. We've asked them about their use of formal and informal financial services to save, to borrow, how they receive money from the government or family living elsewhere, to how they manage their financial risks. In 2021, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we interviewed over 125,000 nationally representative adults in 123 countries, and we published the fourth edition recently of the Global Findex database, which I'll talk about today. So we define financial inclusion as the availability and equitable access to appropriate, affordable, and timely financial services that are provided in a well-regulated environment. That means people are offered, for example, full uh, credit terms uh, and conditions. Um, we financial inclusion can uh, help achieve development goals in a number of ways. First, by increasing income, by allowing people to save, to borrow, to invest in business and educational opportunities, to pull themselves out of poverty. It could also help increase financial resilience um, by uh, using financial services, including insurance during a, if there's a fire, job loss, death of a family member, to prevent them from falling into poverty. It also increases transparency. This is good for regulators. It's also good for employees who can show, have a digital record of fair wages, can improve uh, workers' jobs. It can also allow workers for adults to develop a payment history um, that's often uh, being used to access appropriate credit. So there's a growing academic literature showing how uh, offering financial services can help uh, improve financial resilience, lead to better jobs, reduction in poverty, also women's economic empowerment. So for example, 
Um, there's evidence, uh, this is by Japas and Robinson, showing that offering a woman, an, especially a woman, an account can lead to the household, greater household spending on nutritious food. Evidence elsewhere in Nepal, Philippines, shows again, offering especially women their own account increases household spending on nutritious food, health care, and education. Payments into accounts can also uh, give, again, especially women, greater privacy, security, and control over their money. There's evidence in the U.S. that after the government digitized payments, there's a reduction in crime. Um, Acker et al. show that in Niger, paying government transfer payments into an account helps give women greater bargaining power on how the household spends that money, boosts spending nutritious food, and gives women more time to spend in productive tasks. We also have uh, evidence by, um, um, by Ashraf et al. showing in the Philippines, by offering a woman an account, the household's more likely to spend on goods that matter more for women, like washing machines. Um, we also find that direct payments are less expensive to send and receive, more secure, and less vulnerable to theft. In work I'm doing with Martin Kent and Emily Breza, we show that workers uh, in Bangladesh who offered accounts as compared to workers who receive an account but continue to receive their wages in cash, more than double their savings after the employers uh, switch to auto deposit wage payments. We also, there's also evidence on the importance of uh, financial inclusion to build financial resilience. In work um, by Della Velvi et al., um, they show that uh, access to insurance uh, products can help farmers increase their yields and better manage uh, food security. So let me talk a little bit about the Global Findex database. In 2011, when we started, the only available data was what we call supply-side data. That's data collected by regulators directly from the providers of financial services like banks on things like the number of bank accounts. But it was a black box of data. We didn't know how many women had accounts compared to men, how many poor adults saved compared to wealthier adults, how many rural adults were able to make and receive digital payments. And so even with a tremendous team, Dorothy Singer, Sonia Anser, Doug Randall, and others who have worked with me over the years, um, we didn't have the capacity to manage 100 plus surveys on our own. So with a multi-year funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we partnered with the Gallup World Poll Survey, which has been an annual survey of nationally represented adults in over 140 countries since 2005. And we added a module on financial inclusion to ask adults how they manage their money make and receive payments, save, borrow, and manage financial risks. Um, importantly, um, this is, uh, so in most countries, the, excuse me, the data is collected by face-to-face -face surveys. Um, it's done through uh, a, a random sampling of strata regions. Within each strata, random sampling of primary sampling units. But in each primary sampling unit, a random walk of households, create a household roster. And a Kirsch grid, thank you very much, um, to uh, randomly select an individual within the household. And this nationally representation allows us to splice and dice the data by demographic characteristics. Um, so we also, uh, also mentioned we do have this very rigorous methodology. What's so critically important is that the methodology is comparable across all countries. I like to say we're one of the few people with date, comparable data in Sweden and South Sudan. Um, all uh, data collection is overseen by uh, Gallup staff. And uh, uh, the security uh, data quality controls are also done uh, centrally by Gallup. We're also pleased that we have external validation. For example, similar financial inclusion uh, surveys done in Nigeria and Mexico show very uh, similar uh, uh, data over time. I also want to point out the photo of me uh, surveying uh, the question, piloting the questionnaire in about 2012 in Kenya. You can see how this project has aged me over time. Um, but really highlight, I want to bring out some really important points. So one, the tremendous importance of piloting questionnaires in the field and sitting in people's homes and asking the questions open-ended for a number of reasons. First, the data is only as good as people's understanding of the questions. We want to make sure that people really understand or giving us the information we want. Second, we've been able to explain, and I'll talk about this in the presentation, some of the mysteries in the data. What seems irrational to us sitting in DC often makes a lot of sense to poor women in developing countries. 
And third, what we learned uh, in piloting the questionnaire is, he, is that what the data we're collecting, that we collect in demand size surveys, is in a sense perception data. So I'm often asked, you know, why is the data, the supply for data collected from banks higher than the data collected through demand side surveys in FINDEX? The which is right, and it's neither are incorrect. When we ask someone when they have an account, we're asking them, do you perceive yourself as having an account, as being banked? And we often hear in uh, piloting, someone will tell us, oh yeah, I had an account given to me by my employer two bus rides away to receive my wages, but I left that job, so I no longer have an account. So unless people have access to affordable, appropriate, convenient accounts, they may not perceive themselves as bank and be able to reap the development benefits of being banked. Um, okay, so we jump into this year's uh, main results. We sort of have three thematic messages. First, the importance of technology. That's both mobile phones, in addition to biometric identification, remote agents, um, has allowed for the uh, tremendous growth in account ownership around the world. Um, secondly, um, leveraging, in many ways, leveraging technology has led to more equitable access to accounts. We see a reduction for the first time since we started collecting the data in the gender gap, although this masks some regional and country level remaining gaps. We've also seen a, a reduction in the income gap. And finally, um, we, asked, we surveyed this in 2021 during the COVID pandemic. And what we found was that, especially in countries that had a digital readiness before the pandemic, we saw the uh, digital payments being a lifeline for many small businesses as social distancing and mobility restrictions prevented people from using cash, the perception of cash as unsanitary. Um, digital payments became a lifeline for small businesses to make sales. It became a lifeline for governments to quickly and affordably get money into the hands of those in need. So let's dig into the data, starting with um, account ownership. We define an account as uh, one that uh, provided by a formal financial institution, such as a bank or microfinance institution, in some countries a post office or a credit co-op regulated post office accounts or credit, co credit uh, union or cooperative accounts. Um, or with a mobile money service provider, an account that can be used to store money and to send and receive electronic payments. And so over time, we've seen a darkening of the map. We've seen an increase in account ownership from 51% when we started collecting the data to 76% of adults today having an account. In developing countries, we've seen an increase of 30 percentage points to 71% of adults today having an account. To call out some large countries, We've sort of grow, we see over 80% of adults in China and in India having an account. Both countries, we saw a large public investment in the financial infrastructure, as well as policies to expand account ownership. In India, for example, the government leveraged the Adhar biometric identification to introduce the John Don account, JDY accounts, um, which are no fee simple accounts, which are offered across the country to rich, poor women, men. Uh, India slashed their gender gap from 17 percentage points to close to zero. We also see Brazil, South Africa hitting 80 percent. Two countries were in part the digitization of government transfer payments, especially during the pandemic, increased account ownership for adults to receive money into their accounts. And then most substantially, Sub-Saharan Africa, where the uh, introduction and widespread adoption of mobile money accounts has increased account ownership. And let me just pause to mention that due to uh, remaining COVID-19 uh, restrictions and political instability, we're really delighted that we're collecting data for an additional dozen countries over the 2022 20, uh, calendar year, and we'll be publishing data for an additional 10 Sub-Saharan African countries, mostly smaller, low-income countries, um, as well as Mexico and Vietnam in early 2023. So going back, focusing for a moment on mobile money accounts, these are accounts offered by telecoms or fintechs, um, most prominently in Sub-Saharan Africa, but some other economies, such as Bangladesh and Paraguay, where they've had a large impact. The benefit of these accounts is that they're provided by local agents. The same agents who sell uh, time, minutes for your phone, are now also providing financial services. 
This has big benefits for local users who don't have to travel to the nearest branch, which might be in the city, especially for women who might have family responsibilities or social norms which prevent them from traveling. People often also feel more comfortable using someone they know to, uh, for their financial transaction in their village rather than perhaps the intimidation of walking into a bank branch in the city. And also, mobile money accounts and transactions are designed for, uh, for small transactions. They're designed for uh, small denomination, high frequency transactions. They're designed for frequent deposits into accounts and for small payments, which is what we see um, the uh, people uh, in Africa most, uh, most uh, demanding. I mean, so if you're just looking at this map, we see really this darkening. We started uh, collecting the data in 2014. It was really an East African story, and PESA and Kenya, um, whereas today we see 55% um, of adults in Sub-Saharan Africa having an account, including 33% of adults who use a mobile money account. Um, notably, we saw a 13 percentage point increase in mobile money ownership over the past four years, which is equal to the overall growth in account ownership in the region. Um, I guess also uh, important, I guess also, uh, well, I mentioned on this slide, the impact of mobile money on the gender gap, um, especially among younger adults who, where we see the largest take up of technology enabled accounts. We see a gender gap among adults under 35 of eight percentage points in bank account ownership in Sub-Saharan Africa, but find no gender gap among the use of mobile money accounts. As I mentioned, the beauty of the data of the Bansai data, a nationally representative data, so we can splice and dice the data by various demographics um, and income characteristics. We see, as I mentioned, a narrowing of the gender gap. This masks some larger uh, differences. In Turkey, men are still almost 30 percentage points more likely than women to have an account. In Pakistan, men are twice as likely as women to have an account. Um, however, there are other ex examples. In India, for example, slashed their gender gap from 17 percentage points to insignificant. Um, I can give an entire policy research talk on the, the reasons behind the gender gap and financial inclusion. Just to highlight you know, some key uh, barriers, which include social norms, but also importantly, uh, access to identification especially uh, in some sub-Saharan African countries where men are more likely than women to have ID, which is necessary for both financial inclusion as well as digital inclusion. IDs are necessary both to open a bank account, but also typically to um, have your own mobile phone. Um, as well as the technology access, to, the gaps in access to technology, um, where we see uh, in some countries men being more likely uh, than women to have an account. We also know that men are more likely than women to have, uh, for example, to pay for data. So for example, um, we find in India, men are 20 percentage points more likely than women to have an account. But we find in Pakistan that 88% of men have their own mobile phone compared to only 42% of women. This is a barrier not only for financial and digital inclusion, but also for women to access e-commerce opportunities, online educational opportunities, e-health, and others. Um, we also look at the gap in income, um, which has fallen over time significantly. Again, as financial services are moving into being accessible in poorer rural areas, access has increased. And finally, where we haven't seen as much movement is in the education gap. This is clearly endogenous to income, um, but we still uh, continue to find a large gap um, and a large majority of the unbanked being those with only a primary education. And what this really, again, highlights is we need to proceed with caution, that as we expand account ownership, especially among those with less education, poor adults, rural adults, we have to be really careful to design these products so that the poor, the less educated, can use them safely on their own. We know that adults with less financial education, lower financial capability and confidence, are more vulnerable to financial fraud and abuse. And we need to proceed with caution in the design of the products and the consumer protection. So we have another uh, advantage of demand side data is we can ask the unbanked, why don't you have an account? Um, we, two, multiple answers are permitted. Most commonly, I don't have enough money and accounts are too expensive, which suggests to me that if the accounts were more affordable, people might have the money to use them. We hear about uh, almost 40% of adults saying that banking services are too expensive. 
That number is 15 percentage points higher in Latin America, a region that often uh, plagued by high bank concentration, less fintech competition. We also hear the financial services are too far away. Both of these reasons can be and are being addressed, for example, uh, with fintech products in some countries. Um, also, here the other, we, I'm using somebody else's account. This is more commonly given by women. Um, and this is also, again, uh, correlated, related to in countries with higher banking costs. Um, where, my, for example, in Indonesia, we see a very high, uh, much higher percent of adults giving this reason. Um, it may make more financial sense for the household to share uh, one account or use their household heads account. But again, as I like to say, I would never save my personal savings uh, in the account only owned uh, by my husband. Um, it's the importance for women to have their own account and their own place to keep money safe outside the home. Um, and again, lack of necessary documentation. Interestingly here, over half of adults who tell us documentation is a barrier tell us elsewhere in data we collected with the ID for D team that they have national ID. And so what's going on seems to be that in many countries, banks go beyond the regulation, asking for additional documentation requirements, such as residency requirements, um, which might particularly hurt, for example, urban poor uh, domestic migrants who may not have permanent residency. And finally, religious reasons is a small percent globally, although, for example, a quarter of adults in Iraq uh, give us as a reason, suggesting that in some markets there might be opportunities uh, to introduce Sharia-compliant products. So this data, along with additional data, where we ask the unbanked, hypothetically, could you use an account on your own? Along with the data showing that the majority of unbanked are women, poorer adults, uh, rural uh, residents uh, with primary education, again, suggests how could the challenge of designing the right products, the right consumer protection environment, so that people can safely and affordably use financial products on their own. Um, and then before I proceed to the uh, section on use of accounts, you know, as a segue, I I'd like to mention just uh, we have, for only sub-Saharan Africa, we actually ask adults who have a mobile money account, can you use the account on your own? And we find that about a third of adults say that they can't. They need to ask an agent to help them, or they need to ask a family member. Women need to ask their husband or sons to withdraw the money for them. Um, this is a, you know, the challenge here is this is, again, exposing uh, these uh, users to financial fraud and abuse. We know that agents also often ask for illicit additional fees. We also, you know, we are, there's a generation of research my colleagues here have worked on showing the benefits, for example, of paying mothers the money directly rather than to the household head if the woman needs her to give her card or phone to another family member to withdraw the money for her, she's losing that control over the money. And so this, you know, this is, uh, relates to the importance of the design of products, which are easier for uh, less educated, poor adults to use. It also highlights the importance of the governance of agents. Uh, my colleague Chavi Ginny and others have been working on um, the importance of making sure um, that agents provide complete and not misleading or incomplete uh, information. So how are adults using their accounts? So uh, let me point, so we define a digital payment as using a card, a phone, or the internet to make or receive a payment. There's a number of case studies. If you use, um, if you receive money from the government or a private employer, or for the sale of agricultural products directly into your account, if you use your account to make or receive domestic remittance payments, if you use your account to pay a merchant or utility bill, or any other uh, bill or uh, payment. Um, we've seen a tremendous growth in digital payments, uh, more growing faster than account ownership over time. And there's two things to point out in this figure. One, that the gray bar on adults who, use, who have an account who use for digital payments is sh uh, shrinking. Most adults um, are using uh, their accounts. Um, if we exclude India, this number is even higher. Um, so we find that, um, uh, my number. Uh, so, uh, uh, sorry. So, we, uh, the second thing to point out is um, the 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 uh, two shaded bar. So, what we're showing here is, in the past, adults who were paid out paid into an account typically cashed it all out and just used it more like a transaction account. And again, not reaping the benefit the, the full benefits of digital payments. However, what we're finding is that more adults being paid into account are also using their accounts to make payments, keeping the money digital. 
And so why do we care about this? So paying adults into an account, as we've discussed, has its benefits in and of itself. It's often, for the government perspective, it's safer, it's cheaper. It also creates that transparency, which has been shown to reduce leakage or corruption. For the recipient, it's also safer. They have a safe place to keep the money rather than taking it home with a wad of cash and keeping it in their home. Um, but we also are interested in keeping the money digital as it can relax liquidity constraints um, and help build out the digital ecosystem, which is very much what we've seen in the most recent data. So let's unpack the data now into a number of case studies, starting with government transfers or pensions. And so we find that 67% um, of adults um, are pay, who receive a government payment are paid it into an account. Um, and as importantly, really striking numbers, we find that 865 million adults, that's 18% of adults, including 423 million women, open their first account to receive money from the government. And as I'll show in a few slides, increasingly, these adults are not completely cashing out, but also using their accounts to make payments, using their accounts to save and to store money. We also ask about the use of accounts to receive private wages. Now, of course, this bumps into challenges in formalization and taxation. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, a very small percent of all uh, employment is in the formal uh, sector. However, increasingly, global, even looking at global value chains, for example, um, who have incre interestingly, there the digitization, for example, of wages is being driven by the ultimate buyers. They want their acquiring the gap, for example, requires all their suppliers globally to pay their workers electronically. That's for the they want the electronic trail of the fair wages. Um, I've done some work uh, with Martin Cairns in Bangladesh and in Cambodia, showing that from the factory's perspective, it reduces the costs of, of making payments, the security costs of handling cash, and the garnished productivity time of workers standing on line to receive their wages. And then importantly, from the worker's perspective, again, we're seeing this, these benefits, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so in a paper with uh, Martin Kant and Emily Brisa, we, looked, we, uh, we worked with a garment factory in Bangladesh. We offered accounts to a number of workers. Some workers with accounts continued to be paid their wages in cash, and some received auto deposit of their wages. We saw an increase in savings. We saw an increase in ability to manage the money over the month. Fewer shocks, like uh, skipped meals at the end of the month. But we also saw an improved, what we call the learning by doing. That over time, the workers paid into an account versus workers who had an account which weren't used for that purpose developed greater financial capability. So what this is showing is, uh, for example, workers paid into a mobile money account over time were significantly more likely to make uh, payments, for example, sending money home to their family in the villages directly from their phone rather than handing the money to an agent to do so for them, often exposing them to additional fees. Um, and on the right-hand side, again, showing that uh, those workers with mobile payroll were less likely to make indirect transactions using an agent. Um, in a side experiment, we also sent sort of a mystery shopper experiment. We sent agents posing, I'm sorry, we sent actors posing as garment workers into agents around factories that paid electronic wages versus factories that paid in cash. And we found that these actors, these garment workers in the, uh, in, at the agents around factories that digitize their wage payments were less likely to be asked for informal additional fees. Again, suggesting even the spillover effect that workers paid into accounts become fi uh, financially savvier customers. Um, we also ask a question on the receipt of agricultural payments. Here, too, um, we're not referring to uh, informal uh, um, farmers. However, increasingly, farmers are selling to global value chains. Think coffee, tea, uh, cocoa. Um, and farmers are perhaps those in most need of formal financial services. They're often paid a lump sum of money after their harvest, which they need to stretch to the next crop. They need input financing for seeds and fertilizer. They often need insurance products. Um, and so digitizing their payments can be a first step into the formal financial sector. There are also growing examples of the use of, um, of linking digital payments um, and input financing to more sustainable farming. So, for example, 
um, using, uh, so and we talk about this in the 2022 uh, World Development Report, Finance for an Equitable Recovery, the idea of embedded finance, that by linking input financing to the ultimate sales, you can have, uh, um, you can help, for example, selling farmers higher quality, more sustainable seeds can lead to uh, greater and more, um, uh, more sustainable output, which can then uh, receive better financing terms. And so, but the, point, but the point here is that with a few exceptions, countries like Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, most payments are still made in cash, um, creating tremendous opportunities to digitize. So for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's 70 million unbanked adults and 50 million banked adults receiving payments for the sale of agricultural payments completely in cash. And so next we look at, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but, yes. Um, and next we look at uh, how adults send and receive domestic remittance payments. And so I think I could still have my numbers. If not, it's okay. <laughs> we look at how, so, and we only look at domestic remittance payments, um, not because international remittances are often larger in volumes, but more adults are, but very few adults in most countries actually send or receive these payments, as opposed to remittance payments, where we find over half of adults in Sub Saharan Africa send or receive a domestic remittance payment. And quite excitingly, if you look at the figure on the left, what we find is that most adults in Africa are using mobile money to send and receive these payments in a safer, more affordable way. But outside of Sub-Saharan Africa and countries, markets like Cambodia, Philippines, we're still seeing mostly the use of money transfer services, which not only are often more expensive, but they require the uh, recipient, the family back home, to take home a lot of cash instead of offering them the potentially a safe place to keep their money. So now let's get into some really interesting new data. And so when we, we were in the field in uh, 2020 uh, with the Finnex questionnaire, when the world shut down and because of concern, health concerns about the interviewers and the communities, um, we quickly um, postponed, uh, ended the data collection and postponed to 2021, but we quickly added a few additional questions. And so this is what was you know, uh, intriguing me that let's think about regions with digital readiness that had a digital infrastructure like Latin America and the Caribbean. But because of issues in formalization and taxation, there's actually very little take up of digital payments. And so during the pandemic, when, social, when mobility and social distancing requirements shut down and made um, in-store purchasing impossible, were these for uh, or cash payments uh, impossible? Did these firms adopt uh, digitized merchant payments? And what we see is you know, just the tremendous adoption of digital payments during the pandemic. We find that globally, 20% of adults made a digital merchant payment. I mean, they paid for the groceries using a phone or a card, um, including 40% of those uh, adults making their first merchant payment during the pandemic. In Latin America and the Caribbean, 40% of adults uh, made a digital merchant payment during uh, in 2020, uh, 2021, including 15% of all adults in the region who made their first merchant payment during the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, thinking about looking at countries like Argentina and Brazil um, and, and others. Um, let me also, let me go back a slide too. I wanna to talk about Mongolia for a second. Um, actually, I can talk about it right here. So um, what's going on in Mongolia? Mongolia is an interesting case. Mongolia has children's accounts. Apparently there's an expression in Mongolia that you call your bank before you call your mother when you have a baby. And that's because starting at birth, you can get small payments into your account every month. People watch this money grow over time. They become financially savvy, the learning by doing I was talking about earlier in watching their money grow and are heavy users of accounts. It's also a country that has uh, almost universal electrification as well as it's a very sparse, large country and digital payments play a really important role um, for herders to uh, order their uh, inputs and, and to pay online. And sure enough, Mongolia as well, having that infrastructure had a very high quick adoption of digital payment, merchant payments during the pandemic. Um, and, and, but you know, taking a step back, Here's a big question I have, which is now that the world's reopened and cash has become an option again, will these firms, these merchants in Latin America continue to accept digital payments? 
right? So the potential costs are, first, we know POS uh, transactions are relatively expensive in the region. Second, there might be higher tax liability. So what will encourage firms to continue to accept digital payments? Well, it's if they see benefits, um, and most commonly would be um, access to credit, which small businesses often are in dire need of. Um, and here, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, there are opportunities, for example, in embedded finance. Embedded finance means, so what do creditors need? They want greater visibility into firms' performance, and having tracking live real-time payment data gives that real-time information visibility into the firm's performance. And they want greater recourse in the case of non-payment. And greater recourse can mean linking those digital payments, for example, so that the lender is paid directly from the digital transaction before uh, the seller. Um, and so there's a number, yeah, you know, so there are many, uh, there's tremendous innovation in the space of algorithmic um, uh, credit uh, scoring and embedded finance to link digital payments to access to credit. But it certainly will be an interesting uh, question going forward to see how, whether we see further progress or pullback uh, in the use of digital payments. Um, I'll also mention that there are examples, for example, Uruguay and Korea, where taxation was actually used to incentivize the adoption of digital payments quite successfully. Um, in both countries, um, effectively sellers were given tax breaks on uh, income uh, for digital payments received, as well as customers were given breaks on sales tax on digital payments made. I think an interesting, certainly interesting avenue for research, which hasn't been uh, done well enough, is the impact of the digitization of payments on uh, resource mobilization and tax collection. Okay, so next we also look at um, the use of um, the electronic payments of utility bills. We ask if you've made an electric trash or water bill um, and how you've paid it. Um, and this is far more than just a convenience. Uh, there are many examples, for example, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa uh, for pay-as-you-go models of, of more greener, more sustainable electrification, which depend on a digital payment model. We also know that online payments are related to on-time payments, which again could potentially help encourage greater investment in uh, greener uh, utility provisions and electrification. And so here, too, we see... Um, that have a, a large adoption in some countries of digital uh, of like uh, sorry of digital payments electronic payment uh, payments from an account either digital or um, electronic direct uh, account transfers during the pandemic. Although as you can see here, there's still tremendous opportunities. So the sum of the two blar, two blue bars are adults who pay electronically. Uh, the orange are those who continue to pay in cash. You know, for example, Indonesia, Egypt's another example, India, where there's still tremendous opportunities to digitize these payments. Okay, so let's talk about, move on to savings. So although I mentioned digital payments is the largest use case for accounts, we also very much, I always refer to savings as the most important payment to oneself. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned, um, the digitization of government payments, uh, especially wage payments, agricultural payments, can encourage auto deposit savings. We can leverage technology to encourage people to save. And what we're finding today is that about, um, for the first time, more than half of adults who saved choose to do so formally using an account. And so here are just some examples of countries, um, not surprisingly, China and throughout East Asia, many in some other East Asian countries, we see relatively high savings rates in accounts. Um, but let's talk about Kenya for a second. What's going on there? And so um, one of the most, I think, exciting findings in the data this year was we added a new question. So this is a question we asked, do you, do you save? Do you put aside money for the future? If yes, how do you do so? We asked about you know, using an account, semi-formal ways, which are both um, community savings groups as well as SUSUs which are common in West Africa, where a guy in a moped will pick up a dollar a day from a woman and give it back less a day savings at the end of the month. So these women are paying to save money outside their home or other methods, typically cash or livestock or jewelry. Um, we're actually a little vague about this because when we piloted this in sub-Saharan Africa and asked the question, do you have money in your home? Um, a respondent pulled a rifle on the interviewer and said, why are you asking me that question? So we were advised that uh, we probably want to be a little more vague about uh, 
the saving cash cash savings. Um, and so what we asked, but we added an additional question in 2021, and that is, do you save using your mobile phone, um, your mobile money account? And think about it, right? So let's go back to that example of the informal uh, savers. I have Ghana here. Um, in Ghana, we found over 30% of adults telling us they saved using a SUSU. And so we actually went to Ghana, and many of these women had accounts. And so we went to Ghana to ask them, why are you using this expensive form of savings? And they told us the banks just weren't designed for, they needed to save $1 a day outside their home or be taken, borrowed from a family member. Um, and banks aren't designed for those high frequency, low denomination payments. She wasn't gonna take a bus across town to stand in line to deposit $1 every day. But then she realized that the agent next door to her home was a very convenient and easy way to save the money. And what we're seeing uh, in many, we're seeing 15% of all adults in Sub-Saharan Africa telling us they're using a mobile money account to save, including a quarter of all adults in Kenya, Ghana, Senegal, and elsewhere. Um, and as you can see with the figure on the right, not only do we see this, and again, we did not explicitly ask about mobile money accounts in 2017. We asked about formal accounts, which should have been the answer. But regardless, just even looking at the decline from cash savings, um, it really appears that uh, mobile money is having an impact on the way people save in sub-Saharan Africa. I'll, you know, I'll add, this is also related in some countries to uh, regulation uh, uh, around taxation, around mobile money uh, providers' ability to pay interest on accounts, um, which all uh, really requires future research to better understand how we could encourage um, greater savings and encourage, and you know, which enables savers in Africa often to not only have a safer place to save, but also save money on their more expensive forms of savings while maintaining that control and privacy over their money. Um, and then finally, we look at borrowing. Um, we ask adults if they borrowed in the past year. Here, too, for the first time, formal borrowing is the most common source of credit in developing countries. About half of adults uh, tell us they save, um, a little over half uh, in an account. Um, and just pulling out some uh, large countries, um, you know, although uh, Brazil and China, two example, and uh, actually South Africa and Turkey, also being markets uh, with credit cards. Um, and I just want to also point out, uh, we also have a new question. We included also as an option, I'm sorry, we have a new question on effectively digital credit. Do you borrow using a mobile phone, which we ask adults in Africa? Um, and the numbers are uh, high in some of the uh, early adopters of mobile money, such as Kenya, which is, again, perhaps um, important source of credit for people, but also needs to be watched which, with caution um, as those markets develop. So let's bring it all together. We, we created this year a new figure on what we're calling the digital ecosystem. Um, we're showing here, so 71% of adults in developing countries have an account. 36% of adults receive payments into their account. We have the breakdown, about half of that is public or private sector wages, domestic remittances, government transfers, sale of agricultural products. And it's absolutely a sample bias. There is endogeneity. The people who receive payments don't look like the general population. However, we find that among people who receive a digital payment, over 80% are making a digital payment as compared to less than 50% of the general population. They're using the money to store money. We have a new question on, um, in addition to the savings uh, series of questions, we ask a simple question, do you typically keep some money in your account? This may be for convenience, but we heard in piloting it's often cash management. It's, it's, I, I ask, where do you keep your money until your end? Of, we ask people, do you save? They tell us, I'm too poor to save. Well, yeah, where do you keep your money until the end of the month bills? Oh, I keep it on my phone or I keep it in my account. Um, more typically, my phone because it's easy um, and convenient to withdraw. Um, so we, we hear, so people who are receiving money are increasingly using their accounts to save, store money, to borrow, and to make payments. And, this thing, and what we're finding overall is that digitizing payments from the government, from private employers, from global value chains, is a way to encourage greater use and adoption of um, formal financial services. And I just want to put up one last figure here. So, you know, colleagues of the World Bank will often say to me, oh, mobile money accounts, that's just to send money around town. It's just P2P payments. 
How does that, what does that have to do with achieving developmental goals? And what this figure is showing us is that that's no longer the case, that of 55% of adults in Sub-Saharan Africa who have an account, 33% have an account with a mobile money provider, half are using that account to receive domestic remittances, about a quarter, almost a quarter to receive wages, almost 13% agricultural products. And those who are receiving money to their account are keeping the money digital. Of, you know, most are making digital payments, that may include P2P payments, but over half are storing money on their account. For cash management, a safe place to keep money over the month, and about 40% of people who receive a digital payment to their mobile money account are using their account to save, and about 20% to borrow. I would add that this also, I think, raises the importance for regulations to adopt to the increase to the broader usage of these accounts, um, that accounts being used to uh, get credit, to save money, regulators need to be aware um, of the additional dimensions um, that are needed, including, for example, around taxation, payment of interest, and certainly consumer protection. So let me take my last couple of minutes to talk about the third dimension of financial inclusion. You have access, you have usage, but you also have the quality and how accounts, how people can use their accounts responsibly, but also how accounts can lead to greater financial well-being. So we, we've piloted this question around the world. The question is, and I'm sorry, it was drenched. Um, can you come up, if you had an emergency, could you come up with 5% of GDP per capita in the next 30 days? So this is about 3,500 US dollars in the US, but 350 rupees in India. And so we've been piloting this question and asking what would be the source of the money for many years. Um, and the last round of piloting, I started asking a follow-up question. You know, one woman asked the other, would say, well, I'll ask my sister. And I finally said, well, how likely is it your sister will send you the money? Oh, very unlikely. Her husband would never let her send me the money. Or we'd ask, you know, men would frequently say, oh, I'll work more jobs. And I'd say, well, how likely is it you could find more jobs? Oh, very unlikely. There are no jobs in my neighborhood. Um, and so we added a follow-up question, basically, how likely is it you could actually get the money from the source you mentioned? It would be somewhat difficult, oh, not difficult at all, somewhat difficult, very difficult or impossible. And so here in blue is highlighted people who would say it would only be somewhat or not difficult to get the money. The reliability of their source of income, which I think is an important nuance uh, to the data. And so we see in high income countries, most people depending on savings, most of that savings is in a bank or other safe place, um, and th the money being there when they need it. In comparison, in developing countries, that's not the case. Most the majority of people, the, I'm sorry, the largest number of people depend on family and friends, over half of whom uh, uh, say it's not a reliable source of money. About a third of adults who say um, I work more say it's not a reliable source of money. However, people who say they're saving typically have the money there when they need it. Um, and, you know, answer to flow and others have shown that even the very poor can put aside a little bit of money, which really want to encourage uh, for emergencies. Um, I'll also just add that we show the data spliced by income. Um, poor adults are nine percentage points less likely than wealthier adults to be able to come up with the money. That's because of the greater dependence on family and work. We also find that women are less likely than men to be able to come up with money because women are more likely to depend on family and friends and less likely to say that the family and friends is a reliable source of money. We also had a, we added a new question. Again, this was drafted before the pandemic. Um, what's your biggest financial worry? And keeping in mind that financial stress is often related to physical stress and to productivity, we ask about a series of stress, of health expenses, which in light of the pandemic was the most common reason given, monthly expenses, old age, and we added school fees. We added school fees, and this wasn't, this is adopted from other questions asked elsewhere, but we adopted that because when we were piloting the questionnaire, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, we kept hearing. And, and again, to my surprise, there's people of all ages, whether they had children or not, were responsible for paying somebody's tuition and told us that school fees was a large, um, uh, was one of their largest financial worries. Ah, my, my favorite. Um, and sure enough, I just really want to point out the bottom bar, the sub-Saharan Africa, where we find 54% of adults in sub-Saharan Africa say that school fees is a major worry, and 30% say it's their biggest worry. And more than it's, there's a women are more than five percentage points more likely than men to give this reason. 
And so again, the goal of financial inclusion is how can we design the right financial products? How can we digitize payments in a way that allows adults to save so they have money for an emergency? How can we design savings products, overdraft facilities, to allow Africans to relax this worry about school fees, allow them to keep their children in school? And so I guess to summarize our opportunities around the digitization of payments, you know, moving from physical branches, which are often inconvenient and more expensive and more difficult to use, to more of an agent, uh, mobile technology. How can we adopt cash-based government payments in a responsible way to electronic deposits into an account? It's good for the government, good for the recipients. How can we encourage cash-based bill payments um, to direct payments from an account, using a card, using a phone, allowing the merchant to build electronic history and access appropriate credit? How can we improve savings at home or with riskier uh, savings groups into automatic transfers into savings? How can we maintain the social aspects of community savings groups to keep the money safe in an account where women can also build a relationship, build a, a payment, a savings history for emergency credit when she needs it? So thank you. I just want to highlight the report, all the underlying data, all 123,000 observations is available on our website in the World Bank Micro Data Library. And I very much encourage you to dig into the data yourself. So thank you. Thanks, Laura. That's incredibly, uh, that's quite a feat uh, to go through uh, that incredible amount of data, this amazingly rich database. Um, and I, I guess we'll be digging into various aspects of the, the, the points you highlighted and maybe some questions about them. Um, with that, let's turn it over to, to Andrew for, for some comments. Um, should we get this, should we make sure the slides are up or do we have to? Uh, okay, thank you so much, um, Dion and Leora. This is uh, fascinating. So um, I'm going to um, limit my remarks to very few uh, points. Um, the report is excellent. It is takes a, a big sweep and um, lay of the land on financial inclusion. Uh, and so, you know, it has lots of details, very descriptive, but, you know, gives you really great ideas about the trends um, and uh, new issues that have come up in financial inclusion. So I won't get into the details of that. But my main takeaway is that there seems to be a convergence in financial inclusion between the, I mean, the high income countries and the, and the low income countries. So, you know, use of accounts is up. Uh, sorry, I mean, the, the ownership of accounts is up 71% for, um, you know, developing countries, 76% global. Um, you know, recent expansion is much more geographic, uh, more, more, much more geographically spread than just being driven by China and India, which, which is what the previous report basically showed. And more importantly, you know, things like mobile money um, accounts um, have been major drivers of these kinds of uh, access uh, in places like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the use of accounts is also, um, um, you know, a positive development because, you know, more people are making digital payments, uh, more, more of them are saving formally, more of them are borrowing formally, uh, especially in high income uh, countries. So, so what's the problem then? Um, well, for a start, we have 1.4 billion people who are not yet unbanked, right? So what I'm going to do is ask a series of questions. Um, I wouldn't have any answers. I'm not a, an expert on financial inclusion, but I'll ask a couple of questions on the unbanked, a couple on the issues of use of accounts. Um, and then I have you know, some speculative ideas about how to do, um, how to increase uh, financial inclusion in the future. I mean, the future of financial inclusion, especially in a place like Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, my remarks may seem a little bit more general, but I think they will be 
uh, informed mostly by what I know about Sub-Saharan Africa's um, landscape on financial inclusion, right? So, so the first issue on the bank is the following, right? So one of the drivers of um, bringing more people into the financial services and in financial sector um, is the use of things like wages for payment, I mean, to, uh, paying them into an account, right? Or the government's basically using an, you know, transfers and paying them into an account and asking people, okay, you have to open up an account in order to be able to receive transfers or pensions. Um, or in, in, in private to private transfers, basically remittances, right? So, so that has been one of the major sources of uh, increasing the or pulling more people, unbanked people into the into the bank, you know, financial sector. There is also this availability of new technologies that have arrived, right? Like mobile, cheap mobile phones, and there's been an infrastructure that has been built around that, you know, agent networks, um, digital IDs, um, and, and so on and so on. Uh, cell towers and so on, but here is the here is the thing that that uh, that comes to mind, right? So, have we basically exhausted the value of that, the incremental value of that, right? Um, uh, these are much easier things to do um, for governments um, and and for and you know for for governments at all levels, right? But even if in fact we could we bring everybody who is supposed to be earning a salary into the system, that's usually only about 20 to 40% of the population, right, at most. So there will still be a lot of people who will be left outside uh, of, that, of, of, that, of that dragnet. So, so is, that, is that gonna be a problem going forward, I guess, is the question, right? Um, so fewer people earning wages formally Fewer even earning transfers, especially you know cash transfers. Social you know social protection systems are are very you know the the, the coverage is very low and weak. Um, infra infrastructure is going to be harder to build uh, in remote places and rural areas now, especially you know building a, a, a large agent network, uh, which is what in you know places like Africa where that you know that has been a major um, source of uh, uh, connecting people. And then we're going to run into things like social norms, right, which are harder to change, especially for women. Uh, um, in, I mean, I know for sure, for example, in places like South, you know, South Asia, it's very hard for women to actually join the labor force. It's even harder for them to um, maybe use cell phones and, and things like that. In some places, not everywhere, but in some places, some big countries, right? So, so these are going to be bigger obstacles going forward. And so what is the... Um, I, I'm just putting that question up because I, I suspect that now that we've kind of uh, exhausted the, the easier things to do, it's going to be a lot harder to actually bring more people into, into, um, into this system. Second issue is just widespread poverty in, this, in a lot of these countries, right? Um, even though in general poverty is coming down globally, uh, this, you know, and, and we know there has been a setback because of the pandemic, but at least the longer term trends are that poverty levels are coming down, but there's still a lot of people, hundreds of millions of people who are out there poor. And they tell that, they, and then the report shows that in fact, people do say that the reason they don't have an account is because they're, you know, they just don't have money. That's maybe an, a, a simpler definition of what it means to be poor. Um, and then there are these large transactions that are being done um, informally. Um, so, so the question that comes to mind for me anyway is, is the widespread poverty and informality basically exposing the limits um, of the technology that like, like mobile, cheap mobile phones that have been a major source of uh, bringing people into the, into the financial uh, um, system? Um, and I mean, not, I mean, and the reason that this prompts, the, the reason why this prompts a question in my mind is precisely because there are all these people who have these mobile phones, half of the people who are unbanked actually have mobile phones, right? As, as the report says, right? Um, so why don't they, you know, why don't they use this, uh, these technologies? To, and, I, and I suspect it's probably because they're just poor. And so the bigger question is, can, can financial inclusion from now on is it possible to accelerate it without basically having 
you know, more sustained growth, better jobs, um, um, and rising incomes, right? So that's, that's a protocol. So then the first question I have on use of accounts, what I notice is that the, the people who live in high income countries just seem to get a lot more out of their, out of their accounts than people who live in developing countries, right? Um, so certainly a lot more people, if, if just single thing like digital payments in accounts seems to be relatively high, right? So what I remember at least from the report is that about 95% of the people if we live in high income countries actually do use their accounts for digital payments. But 39% use it for digital payments, for saving, for borrowing, and so on, right? And all three, the people who use all three is just about 10% the share of the population in developing countries. And so why is that? Um, uh, and so I, 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 I think Here's where, you know, the, the report is excellent because it's descriptive and it gives you a lay of the land, but here's where these kinds of questions about, you know, why, these, why are there these huge demand gaps arising, right, um, uh, comes to mind. So is it because of financial regulations and are they much, sorry, are they much more strict um, in regulations in developing countries than they are in, in rich countries or vice versa? I have no idea. Um, maybe you, you, you can tell. Uh, is it because of high fees? Um, is there just a lot of problems with credit in markets in developing countries? Um, you know, are the financial products just not appealing at all for, for, for people to save um, uh, using their accounts? Or, um, so I, I've, I, I have no, I couldn't get from the report any answers to these kinds of questions, but nonetheless, these are the kinds of questions that so, sort of comes to mind. You know, just you have, both the rich, people living in the rich countries and those living in developing countries have these accounts, certainly, right? Conditional having an account. Why is it that, in fact, there's no convergence in how they use them, right? Um, and so that's, that's one of the questions uh, that came to mind. Um, second question on use of accounts is just, you know, all these things are going to depend on technology and devices like computers and laptops, um, iPads, phones, and so on and so on. And these things require energy and right, you, you need better connections, digital, you know, digital connections like internet or broadband and, and, and so on and so on, right? And in a, in a context like Sub-Saharan Africa, where maybe less than half of the population have access to electricity and usage is even worse because there is intermittent disruptions um, and you know and you know unreliability um, it's expensive when it's available uh, so and so on and so on. so like they, there is just a catalog of problems when it comes to this really analog technology you know infrastructure that is really important for um, for connectivity um, and using use, you know, connecting these devices to systems that will make it uh, its use much more um, important and, and valuable, right? Um, so, so for example, we 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 did a report recently on on digital technologies um, and 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 farm performance in, in Africa, which is which is um, soon to be published. And 83% of the people in Sub-Saharan Africa live in areas with internet coverage, all right? But only 27% of them use it, right? So it's similar to this issue about, you know, you have these devices, you have these technologies that can actually allow you to connect or to um, use these services, but you don't. And, and the, reason, the reason for us in the report that we found, you know, this is the case is affordability issues. Um, so there's, you know, the cost of connection, uh, cost of data, and so on and so on. It's very, very expensive. Um, and, but also there is this persistent issues about lack of cheap, affordable, reliable, you know, things like electricity, right? So, so, that, so the question is, can financial inclusion expand without universalizing access and, and, and use of, of these kinds of infrastructure? Um, so finally, let me, um, let, let me just end by saying Look, the, for me, I, I, and this is purely speculative, um, 
there is going to be, in order to draw a lot more people into this financial um, services, I think there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done to build trust. Um, there, is a, there are just a lot of people with residual distrust of financial system. They don't understand the fee structure. They think they are very opaque. There are too many of them. There are layers of them and so on and so on. They think that they're going to be you know, defrauded. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done to actually build trust, to bring a lot more people. That will require you know, those things I mentioned here. Uh, products that are very easy to use, um, even for people who are illiterate, right? I, I mean, you know, maybe you use pictures or icons so that they know that they can take, when they click on that icon or, um, or, or that picture that they, 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 the, what, the action that, that they want to take in is actually the one that's gonna be taken, right? You know, data security issues are gonna be big. Um, and so, and of course, lowering of costs of use. Uh, so that, that's gonna be important. But there is one group, I think, that has been difficult to get into the system uh, and that will be very important to get into the system. And that's, it's, you know, these groups, you know, micro enterprises that are kind of outside of the formal structures, don't want to be part of them, um, you know, because, you know, there's just a lot of uh, benefits to remaining outside of the system, I think. Um, so, so there is, but there is a huge potential if they can, if there is some demonstration of how um, this informal, informal businesses can, can use these services productively, right? In order to increase their profits and their, you know, their customer reach and, and so on. There is a huge potential to bring a lot more people into the, into the financial services and increase inclusion. Um, there is one other thing finally that I want to say, which is that there is the, the African countries have committed to this continental free trade. Um, and part of, the, part of the obstacle right now is in, in reaching a lot more people into you know, bringing them into this uh, services is precisely because these markets are too small. They seem very, uh, you know, like they have these thick borders um, and lots of, you know, very little competition. Um, and, and so, so there is not a whole lot of services that reach as many people as possible. So if, if in fact, the continental free trade agreement can break down these barriers, um, allow cross-border kind of trade, um, there is a possibility that in fact, a lot more people can be brought into this system, right? Uh, so there's huge potential there, um, especially if in fact, uh, all of a sudden because of these larger markets, um, e-commerce expands. But to do that, there's gonna be a lot of other things that have to happen, right? You need to probably like work on uh, modernizing your logistics and delivery systems. You have to make sure that at least, you know, they are address the addressing, so to be able to deliver something to a physical address is uh, people can find these places which don't exist right now, but you know potentially with digital addresses possible to deliver them. But but these are some of the opportunities that exist um, uh, for 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 financial inclusion in the future. So let me just stop here. Great. Well, thank you, Andrea, and and, and um, for that those good questions and then those hypotheses and and I suspect not all of these have answers which is great because from the perspective sitting in the research department, I think you've laid out an incredible research agenda. Um, but uh, before opening up to, to the online and in the, the audience in the room, um, uh, we have one question on YouTube that I'll come to afterwards, but do you want to have a chance at kind of reflecting on some of Andrew's comments and questions? Um, I don't think you can answer them all, but, but, but again, uh, you know, as part of this is laying out the development of a research agenda, I think I think picking up on some of what you see um, as the key questions in your mind and how they might overlap. Can I just add one more? Of course. <laughs> so the, in the current environment, there is a lot of, a lot of these countries right now are dealing with huge financial pressures. They have high debt levels, um, lots of fiscal problems, and they're thinking about taxing digital transactions, financial transactions, right? Um, that will get in the way of actually financial inclusion because a lot of people might actually opt out of 
out of you know the financial system if in fact they're going to have to pay these higher taxes right there's also that tension taking place so uh, i wonder what um, what you guys think about uh, you know how these countries should balance between raising revenues which they need desperately uh, but at the same time um, trying to bring in as many people as possible into the financial system great back to you they are Thank you. Um, a series of difficult questions. I, I will address the last one first. Um, I've done some work uh, for the um, in Latin America on informality and digital payments. Um, I would say that you, certainly the numbers point to the very large um, uh, tax evasion, but the lower tax payments by large corporations, which should probably be prioritized over tax collection from informal firms. Um, it certainly, my perspective would be to encourage uh, digitization of informal firms so that they might grow and they are able to develop uh, payment histories um, before worrying about initially about uh, the tax revenue. But that's, uh, I, I agree that's an important area for uh, future research. Um, so going back to your question, I, I, let me just pick up on the point about trust. Um, so what's interesting is in the data, um, you know, we ask them bank why you don't have an account uh, because I don't trust banks. It's high in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, which was plagued by you know, bank appropriations, et cetera. Um, but it's also really high in Latin America. And that's because it's associated also with high bank uh, fees, especially unexpected fees. And so if you weren't expecting to pay a fee for withdrawal or for maintaining a balance, you're going to lose trust uh, in the banking uh, sector. And so you know, encouraging use you know, very much and building trust is related uh, to the consumer protection and greater trust transparency. Um, in work we've been doing looking at, especially around bank regulation and also mobile money regulations and use of accounts, um, it's not ready for prime time, but certainly something that's emerging is, and interestingly, the most important regulations are those around consumer protection. Um, and, and it makes sense, right? It's this trust that your money will be kept safe, trust that there won't be unexpected fees um, on, on your transactions. Uh, and, and finally, I, I fully agree on the importance of, you know, I guess additional, additional research around um, how to encourage the digitization of not only formal businesses, but even smaller firms. Um, you know, we discussed the benefits. Um, but, um, you know, you look at China, where 80 over 80% of adults report making a merchant payment using a card or a phone. Um, you know, that was a certain set of policies, which also have you know, different tax implications than you know, some countries, again, Latin America, um, which are, um, you know, some countries uh, where digital payments is used uh, by uh, reported to tax authorities. So I, I think there's more, as I mentioned, a need for more research, understanding the relationship with digital payments and tax revenue and collection perhaps more carefully looking at examples in Korea and in Uruguay um, to better understand uh, the policy choices that need to be made around incentivizing uh, these payments and resource mobilization. Can I just get a sense in the room if anybody in the room has questions? Okay, two questions in the room. Oh, three, sorry, okay. Um, can I, before going to the, the, those questions, can I just ask you to reflect on one thing you didn't pick up on, which was the, the question of have we exhausted the easy wins uh, in a number of countries? Uh, yes and no. So yeah, as you point out, you know, there are regions such as Sub-Saharan Africa where the formal labor force is relatively low, um, where government payments are relatively, go out to a relatively smaller uh, percent of adults. Um, you know, Turkey, for example, which I mentioned, has one of the world's largest gender gaps in account ownership. Men are more than 20 percentage points more likely than women to have an account. Really interestingly, um, among wage workers, we find no gender gap. So women who have, an, uh, uh, who are employed, uh, wage employed, have the same account ownership as men who are wage employed. The big difference comes out of um, women who are out of the labor force as compared to men who are out of the labor force is almost a 30 percentage point gap. And so you know, this is because banking services are expensive. If you don't have a direct need for an account to keep your money or to receive your money, 
um, you may not incur those costs. And so, you know, I say yet another benefit of increasing women's labor force participation would hopefully be um, increasing uh, financial inclusion. If that said, in markets that offer more affordable banking services, such as through mobile money accounts, we do see larger penetration among those who are out of the labor force, among poorer adults. Um, and again, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's also um, Bangladesh, where we saw a significant narrowing of the gender gap over time as more women are adopting uh, mobile money accounts. Um, so we, we're not there yet. There's still hundreds of millions of adults who are uh, receiving a government payment or a wage payment, agricultural payment in cash. Um, and again, I, I, just, I, I see tremendous potential in these agribusiness chains. And this is some more thing that both the IFC and World Bank are, are engaged in working with both government chains such as coffee and tea, but also private sector providers like Heineken, who's a large barley buyer in Ethiopia. Um, and so leveraging the market power of some of these global value chains um, to uh, digitize payments. But again, this is all conditional on making sure that the recipient has an accessible, affordable, and safe way of cashing out their money, um, that they understand how to use their accounts re uh, responsibly, you know, and, and all the other features of uh, the financial and digital infrastructure that you mentioned, including network security, uh, data privacy, um, and a strong and enforced consumer protection framework. Great. Okay. So let's maybe go starting with Ishani and then Javi and then over here. Anybody else on this side of the room? Okay. Let's maybe go ask the three questions and then. Thanks, Leora. Um, this is super interesting. And I do want to say that um, Anuklik and I have a paper with uh, these data, not, not this year's obviously, uh, but so thank you to all of you um, as a consumer of your data. Um, I was wondering um, if I can squeeze in a couple of questions. Um, the first is, you know, when you talked about the patterns informal borrowing being um, important for adults. Um, I was a little surprised, um, and, and I suspect there's sort of a gender gap there. In fact, I know there is, having used these data, so if you could reflect on that a bit. Um, but tied to that, um, and uh, to Andrew's point about building trust, um, I was wondering if there's work that has looked at the role of social networks. You know, if pineapple farmers can learn from each other, maybe women in particular, who are outside of the system, who have less access to education, who have less access to uh, safety nets, et cetera, you know, they might not um, trust the system enough to, to use a, a mobile money account, even if they have it, uh, but they might learn from each other. And so I don't know if there's work that's looked into this and um, it's so what it's found and, and, you know, specifically commitment savings products might be um, somewhere where demand is relatively high. So just would love to hear your reflection. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so when so talking about usage of these accounts. So, so the question is, um, you've made uh, a, a digital payment, but but what's what's the frequency here? So, is it ever? Is it in the last year? In the last month? In the last week? Um, and and I guess more broadly, what's the um, so so I'm, I'm trying to understand you know whether there's been a move from you know, so the share of transactions and income received from cash to to digital, and and I'm I'm not, so you know, can we use these data to look at that, right? I mean, what you know, are we moving to towards towards a sort of a more a more ca you know a ca cashless economy, and uh, you know, are you know, okay, is there an ecosystem here where 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 most transactions are done are done digitally, right? And so so I'm not so yeah, I'm not I'm not. I don't think we're there yet. I don't know whether the data is there to 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 actually look at that, right? Whether there's been a shift uh, in 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 you know to, to, towards digital digital um, yeah you know digital lives. Yeah, great. Hi, my question is whether you observed uh, spillovers from the the large expansion in mobile money accounts and digital accounts towards the traditional sector and in terms of uh, increasing competition and reducing fees, because we still see a significant share of people reporting fees as, as, as uh, the reason of not using accounts. And I wonder if there is a lag in that report, that people still don't know that more products being offered, or is it that uh, still commercial banks have not uh, adapted and uh, changed the products that they use significantly to target uh, and tailor the poor? 
Thanks. Do you want to take those? Sure. Um, and so in reverse order. Um, so that question is beyond the scope of the data, um, uh, though there is related research. Um, one interesting thing we do find is there seems to be in some markets almost a substitution where we see a decline in people telling us they have a bank account and an increase in mobile money account, um, which is interesting, right? Because it makes sense if the bank account is more expensive uh, fee structure than mobile money account and it's more convenient, you, you may stop using your bank account. Um, I, I would suggest what this also encourages, you know, it, it, it talks also to the inter importance of the interoperability between mobile money and bank accounts. You know, we have models, I was working um, on a project in Ghana on a, on a product that um, allowed mobile money account owners to uh, costlessly sweep their money into a bank account to earn interest um, and develop, because it's almost effectively the mobile, agent, the mobile money agents working almost as a bank agent in that sense. Um, and in that market, it makes sense because the banks are able to offer products that the mobile money providers don't offer, you know, such as credit, such as potentially insurance and other financial products. Um, but I think the market's yet, the market's still evolving in what products are offered by mobile money providers as compared to bank accounts. Um, but I don't, please, thank you, Mike, no more. I, I don't think there's any evidence of banks responding to the mobile money competition by changing their own uh, fee structure. Um, so, Chavi, two things. One is we don't have any information on you know, the extensive margin in terms of how much you're sending or how frequently you're sending it. We ask, have you made or received a pay this type of payment in the past year? Um, could be once, it could be monthly. We don't, that information we don't have. That's sort of beyond the scope. Um, and what's also, I'll add, the reason we ask about everything in the past year is because the data is collected for 140 plus countries over the calendar year. Um, and we don't wanna get caught with seasonality effects, right? And, and also over different rounds, the data might be asked in different quarters or different seasons. And so we wanna have a full year of reference. And so for that purpose, um, we do have a longer time horizon, but we only know about um, in, in, the, in the past um, year. Um, yeah, and, it's, it's, it's Shandi, to answer your uh, questions. So yes, informal borrowing, uh, actually men are more likely to borrow informally uh, than women. There's lots of data, all the data is in the report. Apologies, I don't have all the numbers offhand. Um, and social networks, um, if I could bring up some related research, I've been doing work with um, using transaction level data from a FinTech in Korea that sends home for low income workers from all from a dozen developing Asian countries in East and South Asia to send their money home. Um, and we're finding you know, very large cost savings as compared to uh, bank transfers, um, as well as um, like about half of transactions are made evenings and weekends where banks are closed, additional convenience. But the, uh, the main point of our study is we show that work, low income workers are optimizing their exchange rates. They're actually moving the dates that they send transactions home in order to optimize that exchange rate. And it's an interesting question, right? These are low income workers um, and how are they getting that information? Um, and so the FinTech pays a small bonus if you, re if you refer a friend and we're able to use that information to build social networks. And what we're showing is that the information seems to be spread within the social network. That someone in the social network, especially someone who's used the product for a longer amount of time, um, you're more likely uh, within the social network for other users uh, to share that information and also optimize their exchange rates. Um, so I absolutely agree with you. I think that's an interesting area for future research on how um, information about optimizing the use of formal financial services is spread within social networks. Great, thanks. We had a couple of questions online. I'm just gonna go through them quickly. We, have, we only have a few minutes left, but just in case you wanna pick up on any of them. One, I think, um, is from Webex, which is from Andrew Stone. How long, how strong is the FinDEX methodology at capturing the experience of people in remote rural areas? It's sort of to the representativity of these samples. I think that's the more general point. And then two questions from YouTube. Um, one is about the, the security of the systems. This goes to the trust question that we were, uh, security of the, tr the system, but then the political economy of data tracking. So once, you know, that goes to the informality, do people want to opt into these systems when they can be traced? You've already answered it somewhat, but, you know, since somebody asked that question specifically. And then another question is, 
what have we learned from digital in high income countries? Can we skip some of the mistakes? Um, so you have two minutes for those two, the three questions. Um, um, so the first answer is Andrew's question. Um, so in most developing countries, the data is collected by face-to-face -face surveys. Um, so um, you know, absolutely rural, remote uh, areas are captured. Um, and I would add, though, um, the bigger challenge as, in, in much of the data collection in face-to-face -face is actually the wealthier, um, uh, wealthier adults and the gated community problem. And in many low-income countries, you can't get anywhere near a middle-income home or certainly a wealthier home because of the layers of gates and security guards that prevent you from knocking on people's doors. Um, in many, in, in, interestingly, during co because of COVID um, restrictions and other reasons, um, there has been an increase in uh, the number of developing countries that are now collected by phone. Uh, these are all countries with more than 80% of adults have a phone. Um, and there, you know, certainly we do, uh, we are concerned about perhaps missing um, the bottom end of the pyramid who, um, who lack access to the technology, um, but there are efforts that are made to try to reach uh, those households. Um, so th thank you for the question. Um, and, and I'll also add that we have on our website a methodology note with detailed data by country on the mode of surveying, uh, margins of errors, um, response rates, et cetera. Um, to answer the YouTube question, yeah, you know, this goes back to the absolute importance of you know data privacy regulations, network security, um, and you know uh, to make sure that consumers understand how their data is being used, and so it's not uh, misused as well. Um, and then the interesting question about the high income countries. Um, so I, I, you know, so one of the interesting uh, areas that uh, um, areas that, we, that there are uh, interesting lessons is actually around resilience. Um, we see in uh, many high, in some high income countries, at least, you know, poor adults having some of the same uh, challenges as adults in developing countries, especially around lower saving rates, um, less reliable borrowing, especially in countries where poor adults might depend on credit cards where they might be hitting their limits, um, and access you know, to additional gig in countries where there's a lot of gig workers, access to that gig, uh, gig work. Um, but I would say one of the, something we really strongly find in high income countries is the importance of savings and the reliability of savings in the case of an emergency. Um, you know, learning the importance, you know, like we have here at the World Bank, the importance of auto deposit uh, savings uh, into um, both short term as long as uh, pensions and longer term savings instruments. Um, and, you know, certainly trying to embed um, as we design products to digitize payments, especially to wage workers, to uh, try to leverage technology that's often used in high income countries. Um, to encourage uh, greater savings, to build people's financial resilience. Thank you. We are out of time. I'm, I'm sorry if that's my lack of timekeeping. Uh, but I do want to give a chance to, 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 to Andrew, if there's any last word you want before we close. Um, if you just want to say. No, just, uh, just um, um, a plea to the research team and Leora. Um, so we have an experiment that's about to begin in Ethiopia where they have just opened up their mobile um, um, net, I mean, what do you call them, uh, mobile service provider uh, to Safaricom from Kenya, which has pioneered the M-Pesa, right? I suspect they're going to really roll out um, access to, you know, financial inclusion. So I... I would encourage you guys to pay attention to that and, and try and see how, how that evolves um, over the next few years, so. There, another research idea right on the table, great. Well, thanks everyone for coming out today and for those online who are following, um, I see we retained a lot of our people from the beginning. So, you know, people were paying close attention to, to, to the, the, the presentation and the discussion. So join me in thanking the presenter and the discussion today and thanks everyone. See you, see you next month.